So uh, I see that we start to have people joining uh, the call. Good to see some people from, uh, from Nova Scotia, from the USDA. We have some representatives from a, a small cooperative in Cincinnati, Ohio as well, with some of our Quebecois friends as well in Canada. Happy uh, Saint-Jean-Baptiste Day to you. Happy that you're taking uh, this festival day to, uh, to enjoy the cooperative education and to learn a little bit more about building better food systems. Uh, with me today, I have Karen Zimbelman, Doug O'Brien, and uh, Demi Odetola. Uh, so Doug O'Brien is the president and CEO of the National Cooperative Business Association. Uh, Karen is the senior director of membership and cooperative relations at the National Co-op Grocers. Uh, you have a lot of responsibility there from what I can see in your title, Karen. Uh, and then Dami is the vice president at uh, National Cooperative Bank, uh, specifically in corporate banking there. So really, really happy to have you here today. Uh, nice to see kind of a whole different round of expertise around the table to, to be discussing this conversation. Uh, and should you have any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the Q&A or as well as interact in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, I would just like to thank our sponsors for this event, the 2021 ACE Institute. So Shared Capital Cooperative, huge thanks to them. Uh, the Ralph K. Morris Foundation, always a huge supporter of cooperative education, as well as the Minnesota Farmers Union. And with Farmers Unions, I understand that this morning we have a whole bunch of campers and staff from the Wisconsin Farmers Union. So a warm welcome to them today. And without further ado, I will hand it off to Doug O'Brien, who will moderate today's session. Thanks, Doug. Hey, Michael, thank you so much. Um, and I, I wanna thank uh, all the folks at at ACE um, for, for hosting this uh, really important and timely conversation today. Um, I wanna thank uh, Greg Irving, who's, who's with us. He's on the staff of NCBA CLUSA who helped uh, put together the panel today as well. Uh, and a, a shout out to Kathy Stats and all the campers uh, there at Cap Kendall. Kathy, I, I don't know if you've shared with the campers that uh, my kids are bemoaning the fact, I mean, literally just in these past week that they're not with you uh, this week or in this season, they've, they've been to the camp there uh, in the past and they look forward to doing so in the future. So I hope, I'm sure you're having a great week again uh, at, at uh, co-op camp. Hello, everybody. Um, and uh, I, I just wanna start out, I'm, I'm gonna start out with, the, with a few comments and some framing, we'll look at the agenda here in a second and then and then we'll we'll jump into a into a great uh, presentation from Karen Zimbelman and and um, and we'll and we'll have a panel conversation. I first I just want to talk to to the audience and the folks who chose to participate today, and I want to um, to to thank you for choosing to be part of this conversation and to be choosing uh, choosing to be part of ACE. It's such a critical uh, and an essential function of of the cooperative ecosystem. I know I don't need to tell folks. In this uh, in this audience, but that the continuous focus on education is is is, is simply there's nothing more critical actually uh, for the sustainability and the viability of, of co-ops. So so thank you for everything that you do. Um, so uh, first, a quick note on our panel for those that were looking at your um, your program. Uh, I wanted to 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 just point out that that we are so fortunate to have Karen Zimbelman with us, affectionately known as KZ. To uh, to just about anybody I think who's crossed her path and certainly in the, in the co-op community uh, over her, her story, really time of service and leadership within cooperatives. KZ um, is a former board member of ACE. Uh, she's a current director at NCBA CLUSA. I'm gonna talk about NCBA CLUSA a little bit uh, in just a bit. And, and actually just last week uh, or two weeks ago was reelected to the executive committee again uh, to uh, NCBA CLUSA. And uh, this year will be vetted and feted, I should say, as as um, as a Hall of Fame, um, as a member of the Co-op Hall of Fame. So, Casey, it's so great to have you here. We also have uh, Dami Odetola, who's a, a just a, a well-known and, and highly respected uh, person within the Co-op community, and, and particularly, I think, within the food Co-op system uh, from the National Co-op Bank. So, so glad, Dami, that you're here to lend us your perspective and expertise. Um, Greg, if you want to put up the slide on the agenda, just real quickly, there's introductions. I have a, a little bit of framing. Uh, then we'll have a presentation from KZ that shows a, a, a great example of what co-ops can, can really do and are doing in the food system. And then we're going to have a set of questions uh, for me 
to the panelists and really a conversation about the topic, this fantastic topic that we have before us today, then plenty of time for uh, questions from the audience. So we're looking forward to that. And as Michael mentioned, please put your questions in the chat. Um, and then uh, I have Greg is, is uh, helping me out as well as Tamla Blaylock, our Vice President of Co-op Relations and, and, and trying to sort through and make sure that we, we bring forth, um, you know, just a great conversation. So looking forward to all of that. So uh, first, a quick note in, uh, on the National Cooperative Business Association, CLUSA International. I'm sure most of this audience knows well uh, about the 105 year old co-op Apex Association in the US. Uh, we do advocacy, we do public relations, we do development, we do thought leadership. Um, and, um, and just in a couple of years ago, actually, we, or actually five years ago, we embraced a, a vision to complement our mission. Our mission, of course, is to advocate, promote, and defend the cooperative business model. Our vision, and it has been, and it was just essentially reconfirmed by our board a couple of weeks ago or last week, was uh, is to, to increase uh, the ability of people to use cooperatives to build a more inclusive economy. And by that, uh, we mean an economy that's more participatory, more sustainable, more equitable, more stable, and it grows for everyone. Uh, NCBA Clusa, beyond the domestic work we do, uh, we have been doing international work for the last uh, 65 plus years. We've been in 80 different countries today. We're in 17 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America, using the cooperative principles and values in international development. So that's NCBA Clusa. We are a membership association. Thank you to all of those in the audience who choose to be members of NCBA Clusa. And for those who are not, please consider doing so. So that's, um, that's NCBA CLUSA. So I'd like to talk for just a couple minutes to frame today's discussion, and then we'll jump into the panel. First, um, you know, we, we have to like be express about the context. I'm, I know I've, I, um, I'm sure it's been part of a lot of the conversation in this conference and certainly other conferences, but you know, let's, let's just put it right out there that, that what we've all been through in the last 15 months um, in light of the, you know, the disturbing revelations of this past year caused by COVID and a renewed focus on racial justice. Uh, COVID brought to light not only the inequities inherent in our public health and in the way that society treats its workers, uh, it also put the food system in a new light, both in terms of its fragility and just who benefits and controls that food system. And then on May 25th of 2020, George Floyd was murdered and the world witnessed racial brutality in a way that forced a much larger segment of society to reckon with the roots and the ravages of systemic racism. So in, in this context, the subject of this panel, harnessing cooperatives to build a better food system could not be more timely. And I, I suppose a good place to start is asking just what better means. And I'll posit it means a food system that helps build a more inclusive economy, um, one that's truly participatory, that's equitable. And I'd also uh, kind of put out there at the beginning of this conversation that cooperatives already play a huge role in nudging towards a better food system, but there is much more that can be done. And that's really gonna be, I think, the subject of our conversation today. And while I, I, wanna, I wanna get to KZ and, and Dami very quickly, I, I'm compelled to provide just a few data points to ground the conversation. This, this group here knows very well that cooperatives play a huge role in the food systems of the countries where we live. Um, you know, so let's consider the food chain and think about uh, a few of those crit critical links. And I, I'm just going to very quickly think about um, the, the, the early stage part of that food system, which is focusing on farmer co-ops, and then we'll, then we'll just touch on some of the co-ops that are closer to the consumers and then hand it off to KZ. So here in the United States, um, you know, we know that uh, farmer co-ops play such a critical role, couple data points. Uh, there's about uh, 1.9 million farmers here in the United States. Well over half of, of all farmers are members of more or about 2000 co-ops uh, here in the US. There's more than um, 1 million ag co-ops across the globe. Uh, 
Farm co-ops here in the United States generate about $6.5 billion in net income every year. And more than uh, well over a, a quarter million people are employed by farmer owned co-ops. Um, you know, the, the businesses owned and controlled by farmers play many different roles for those farmers, depending on the need. Some focus on ensuring farmers can get the inputs they need, seed, energy, fertilizers. Farmers also use the co-op business model to use co-ops to band together to market their products at scale and with great sophistication when, when one steps back and really considers the impact and influence of cooperatives in this part of the food system, it's actually pretty astounding. De depending on the sector, perhaps around 50% of all ag goods flow through a cooperative at some point with dairy, maybe the greatest of up to 80% of all milk flows through a cooperative at some point. And then further down the chain, people use co-ops much closer to the consumer whether that is a independent grocery store owners coming together for purchasing grocery store products like, uh, like Wake Fern Food Corp uh, with 354 retail establishments and a revenue of $13 billion that includes brands like ShopRite and PriceRite or consumer owned food cooperatives like the one where I'm a member right here in Tacoma Park, Maryland outside of Washington DC uh, and that I shop at uh, a, you know, a couple of times a week at our, our, our food co-op. And so I, I just looked at the National Co-op Business 2020 edition of the Co-op 100. Folks here, many of you know that, that Dami's uh, bank, the National Co-op Bank, every year they put out this list of the 100 biggest co-ops. And I saw that seven of the 10 biggest cooperatives in the U.S. are in the food system, including uh, CHS as the biggest with nearly $32 billion in revenue. So my point is that people already use co-ops in the food system, and that means people already own control and receive the benefits from their businesses. But in today's context, we need to go deeper and ask ourselves, what else can we do to harness the power of the co-op business model to build a better food system? And, and with that, I wanna hand this over to KZ, who will help us go deeper into you know, one really important facet of the co-op food system and one that I believe can serve as a model for others who are looking to use cooperatives uh, in the food system and to build a better food system. So Casey, I'm gonna hand this over to you. Thank you very much, you very Doug, much. for quite an introduction. Hearing a little bit of feedback, I'm gonna just try to ignore it. Um, uh, so thank you very much for including me. Um, I'm a 35 plus year member of ACE and really tickled to be here. Uh, really enjoy uh, the forum that ACE provides to bring cooperators together and to have great conversations. Um, NCG, the National Co-op Grocers, I'll say uh, um, a little bit about who we are in a second, but just want to note that this is a report that we produced looking back at 2020. It's been out for a couple months now. Um, but we look at a wide range of factors uh, that define how we are trying to improve the system that we, the ecosystem that we operate in, if you will. Um, and um, this is a really high level summary of what that report covers. And uh, so I'm really happy to share it with you. It is publicly available on our welcome to the table.coop website. If any of you are interested in drilling down and once I'm not talking, I will post the link to this report in that uh, in the chat. Uh, so uh, uh, next slide, please, Greg. Uh, yeah, uh, so NCG is a co-op. Um, our members are retail food co-ops. Um, it says here we have 147 members, but we actually have a new member that came in just a month ago, uh, 148 retail food gro grocery stores uh, uh, that are members of NCG. They operate 217 uh, grocery stores around the U.S., just U.S. based. Um, and what NCG does is we provide purchasing co-op functions. So we aggregate the business volume from all of these food co-ops to help them better compete, get them better prices on services or on goods. We also um, do things that are not traditional purchasing co-op functions such as marketing, 
such as branding, um, training programs. We have an extensive uh, learning management system we call Co-op U that um, ha provides training programs for uh, co-op staff um, and business development services. Co uh, a co-op like Tacoma Park, Silver Springs, the one that Doug mentioned, if it wanted to open a second store or if it wanted to relocate, we have uh, staff who can help with that with those services. And I'll make small allusions to this uh, occasionally today, but in 2016, we did a really broad range uh, survey of our member co-ops and asked them how they were doing on, I think it was about 40 to 50 different factors. And we picked um, eight or nine of those factors and said, let's set goals as a, and as a group, as a system, and by 2020, let's set a goal for 2020. And so a lot of this report is us reflecting back on the goal that we set and how we're doing in, some, in seven of those areas. Um, so this report is uh, based on that. And we can go to the next slide. So we start, one of the things that food co-ops really care about is supporting and using and making available locally produced food. That means uh, food that's grown locally or that is manufactured locally. Um, are, we feel like it, it offers better quality food. It builds a stronger economic system, uh, arguably potentially lower carbon footprint. There are people who disagree about that, but in any case, 22% uh, of the sales from the co-ops in our system, the 147, because that's who was included in the survey, uh, the 147 US food co-ops, 22% of their sales were from products produced by local vendors. Um, and the average co-op works with 185 local farmers and producers. You will not find anything like that in the rest of the grocery industry because it takes a lot of time to work with each of those local farmers and producers. And it's true that um, it, you know, time costs. Uh, it takes more staffing. It takes more hours of time to process the invoices, to receive the product, all of those kinds of things. But it really became obvious to us when COVID hit and the shutdown started to happen that, uh, that this, was, this, this really made a difference. We had our co-ops had relationships with these suppliers who suddenly had no way to get their products out. So we saw farmers, dairy farmers, dumping gallons and gallons and gallons of milk. We saw um, uh, farmers plowing under, uh, uh, in their fields produce that was ready to go to market. They had to just plow it under. Um, but our co-ops, where, where our co-ops were working with some of those vendors, they were able to say, bring us all those eggs, bring, you know, as much as you can provide, we will try to get it out there. And in some cases at very good prices for the consumers because the farmers were gonna lose it anyway, but it was much better to at least get the product into consumers' hands than to plow it under. Nobody wanted to do that. So we feel like uh, the, having the relationship with local producers really um, demonstrated the resilience that we're trying to achieve by supporting local. Next slide. Uh, another thing that, another goal that we set is about making good food affordable. And uh, um, nearly 40% of NCG's food co-op stores, 81 of them are located in communities that do experience some sort of food insecurity at rates higher than the national average. So uh, one of the things we do, one of our, the main things we do is we, negotiate with food manufacturers and provide specials. So uh, those specials, we call them co-op deals, uh, save consumers in the course of a year, 25% on their shopping budgets when they're purchasing those products over the course of the year. Um, that, that combined purchasing power gives us a chance to offer lower prices. We also do this on, uh, we also have a program called Co-op Basics where that has over 2000 products in it. Uh, these are products that we call in the industry our EDLP prices, um, everyday low prices. So they're not special. They don't go on special for two weeks and then go back to their regular price. 
every day they are at that $1.19 for a can of beans or whatever the price might be. So these are products that are always on that those special prices. And we negotiate with uh, various producers um, to make sure that we've got some higher quality, sometimes they're organic, sometimes they're natural pr produced, sometimes fair trade certified, but a variety of uh, products that we can offer at really great prices as much as possible, even for small independent retail. Next slide. Uh, another goal is uh, to provide healthy food access. And uh, we, you know, we don't want uh, our food co-ops and the retail food co-op system that we are a part of definitely uh, more affluent more located in more affluent communities. That's what its roots are. That's where we are today. But we want to make sure that that's not just what we're serving and what we do. Um, so we challenged our co-ops. Uh, in 2016, we had 45% of our co-ops that offered healthy food access programs. That means some kind of discount if you have SNAP benefits or any kind of uh, low income uh, food subsidy benefit. Um, there's a program called Double Up Food Bucks where uh, people who have a food buck of this type can get two for one for any fresh fruit or vegetable that they produce. It's a federal program, but we help our co-ops um, navigate the intricacies of a federal program like that. And so by 2020, 76%, uh, three out of four of our co-ops were offering some kind of healthy food access program. Um, uh, we set a goal. Our goal in 2016 was we, that we get to 100%. We didn't get there, but we're happy with the progress over almost double you know, uh, what we had in 2016. Uh, next slide. And you know, we we recognize that good food is really us offering good food is just the beginning. We you know we we know that the co-op principles say we have com concern for community. We buy into that. That's an important aspect of who we are. So we challenged our co-ops to make uh, some kind of contribution to their local community. Uh, it was 0.2 percent of sales in terms of charitable contributions in 2016, we said, let's get to one half, one half a percent of sales. We got to 0.46. We didn't quite make our goal, but we more than doubled what we were doing in 2016. So we're really proud of that. Uh, co-ops making contributions, co-ops donating staff time to local food banks, whatever it might be, just a really wide range of contributions to their local communities. Next slide. Uh, we, NCG strongly believes in uh, doing what we can, taking uh, the, the resources that we have and leveraging them to build a more racially just food system. And uh, this is uh, not easy to do. We started with um, some investments um, or contributions, if you will, uh, it, that are listed here on this slide. Uh, like, for instance, supporting the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, which uh, when COVID shut down, they took uh, produce produced by their farmers and put them into lunch boxes <coughs> or um, uh, grocery bags, you know, and distributed them uh, a food bag uh, program. We helped support that. Um, you know, a variety of, of contributions that we've made. I'll take the next slide um, just as a really quick overview of NCG's own DEI journey, which we began in earnest in 2017. The green uh, items highlight the work that we're doing internally, the structural changes that mm. we're making. The orange are sort of the training and development work we're doing with our staff. And then the purple uh, represent um, areas where we're trying to bring other co-ops, our member co-ops along a little mm. bit more. And we're really just really just scratching the surface of this, but we're, we're trying to get there. In terms of one of the measures, uh, we look at what percentage of co-op staff are, um, are from an ethnic 
minority, a representative of uh, some kind of ethnic uh, minority. And uh, in 2016, it was 17%. Uh, we set the goal of being closer to what the US Census says is uh, that population in the US, which is 40%. Um, we didn't move that needle. And we're very disappointed to see that re those results. And we're really challenging our co-ops to figure out how they can get better at that. Um, next slide. Uh, one thing that we are doing, though, is looking at how we can uh, leverage our resources again uh, to support uh, a more diverse uh, uh, producers in the food system. So we are just starting. Uh, our primary supplier is United Natural Foods. We've challenged them and they are working on uh, labeling the products in their catalog, uh, which items are, um, are uh, meet the criteria of being some kind of uh, diverse criteria, which means at least 51% owned by a systemically um, underrepresented person or group. Um, and then we're providing some of the marketing materials, such as the signage to um, help co-ops label those products in their stores. And uh, we'll, we'll start working on promotions programs, more consumer information about these products, those kinds of things. Um, we're, we're just scratching the surface. <clears throat> um, that uh, supplier that I mentioned, United Natural Foods, um, today, the items that they have listed in their catalog um, that are owned by some that would be, we would call the in inclusive trade criteria group is 2% of their sales. So, so we have some benchmarks today that we can start measuring against. And next slide. Really quickly, we look at how we compare in terms of uh, sales of organic, sales of fair trade. There's something in the U.S. I think and uh, Canadian um, uh, companies also participate in what's called certified B Corp. Um, those are businesses that commit to uh, having a focus that's not just on profit, but on also people and planet, a triple bottom line focus. Um, so you can see the comparison, uh, what the trade is 3% of uh, sales in the grocery industry is organic, 32% uh, in the natural industry, uh, 47% with our co-ops. You can see those kinds of uh, things as well. Um, we include cooperatively produced items here. Um, it's a very much smaller percent, uh, but we, we're we starting to identify who some of those cooperative producers are and how many our co-ops use. Um, and we just learned in this most recent survey that our co-ops on average have 14 uh, cooperatively produced uh, um, items from 14 cooperatively owned companies in their stores, mm -hmm. like Equal Exchange, like, uh, you know, some of the other, I can't, uh, Organic Valley, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, really quickly, I, I have just a couple more things. Uh, uh, looking at climate and sustainability impacts uh, more traditionally uh, with the climate kind of focus, we, we've been challenging our co-ops to get better at uh, lowering their carbon footprint. Uh, we, uh, since 2012, NCG has participated with a an international group in what we call co-op forest, and we've planted uh, almost 2 million um, trees to offset the travel uh, related to staff travel as well as the travel for any of our co-op um, participants for any of our events. Um, in 2016, uh, we were looking at 54 kilowatt hours uh, per square foot of electricity. Our goal was to get it down to 46. We actually got to 33 in 2020. So we're really proud of the fact that our members really are focused on how they can get better in, in many of these areas. It's the story is not all rosy on all factors, but um, it, it really is better. We're, we're getting better. Uh, next slide. Uh, one other factor that we look at is, um, oh, I think I, I already did that one. You can, I forgot to tell you, it's Greg, sorry. Um, so we look at also livable wages, what it takes to pay our staff livable wages so that they can make a career 
in their work at the co-op. Uh, the, note that this picture is from pre-COVID days, by the way. Um, in, in 2016, 67% of our co-ops were paying livable wages. And it uh, by 2020, it was up to 74%. We were, wanted it to get to 80, um, but you know we didn't get there. But uh, we also measure access to healthcare benefits and that kind of thing. I'll keep rolling. Uh, I think the last slide is that I just, we just want to shout out and we dedicated this report this year to the essential food system workers in all of our co-ops. We would not have made it through uh, so much of what we went through without their heroic efforts in this past year. And there I'll just leave it uh, and turn it over to Doug for questions and comments. Thank you, KZ. Um, thank you very much. And um, you can take down the slide, Greg. That's, I think we, I, I think it was really important to spend that time on, on a particular co-op, which is NCG is a co-op. It's a co-op of co-ops, of course, on how they have, um, how they've used, you know, their cooperative identity uh, to, to really improve uh, and to continually improve and to keep, keep themselves accountable. Uh, to improving the food system. So it's, it's great stuff. Thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to jump into some questions with, with KZ and Dami. Um, and Dami, I'm going to start with you. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we kind of, in some of my comments at top, we talked about the, the climate we find ourselves in 2021. You're, you know, you focus on, on the economy, particularly the economy as it affects uh, cooperatives and, and, and their viability. Um, what are what are the strengths and the weaknesses of cooperatives in our current business climate, Dami? Um, thank you very much, um, Doug, and uh, thank you everybody for um, inviting me, um, Ace. Um, I appreciate the invite. Thank you, KZ, for that beautiful presentation. That was awesome. I just wanted to keep quiet and keep listening to it. A lot of uh, data points. But um, to your question and um, talking about the strengths and weaknesses of um, co-ops, um, I mean, everybody knows 2020 was a, um, <clears throat> was a great year, you know, to say the least, it was a, it was a different year uh, due to the pandemic. But what we found out that was the biggest strength or part of the strength for co-ops was the fact that they were very, very, um, a lot of them were nimble. You know, even though they still had um, the issues that were going on, they were able to take advantage of um, advantage of uh, that period to make quick decisions, turn things around. I mean, everybody did, but the good thing about me was that I was able to see a lot of people doing the same thing at the same time, but they were, you know, turning things around. Um, uh, fast, faster than we thought, you know, they implemented a lot of, I mean, during that period, there were so many things that had to be done over, over, um, over a short period of time for them to stay in business. And, um, it was fast, it was fast and it was unbelievable. Maybe some of the larger corporations might not have been able to do that, but that was not the same for, um, for um, co-ops. And then, you know, one of, one of the other strengths uh, that they exhibited during that period and that we saw in the, in the, in the, in, in the current climate is uh, they're, they're very res resilient. Uh, co-ops are extremely resilient. Um, I also like the fact that, you know, I call this the feedback loop, <laughs> ownership and the democratic control of a co-op. I like it and I think it was one of the things that helped them a lot during this period because you own the store and uh, or the co-op and what you do is, you know, because you own it, you provide a lot of feedback immediately and uh, things are implemented um, um, faster. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we cannot, um, um, we cannot overemphasize is the fact that without being local, a lot of co-ops might have gone out of business. You know, um, when Casey was when Casey was talking about um, uh, giving her presentation, she mentioned local. She mentioned she mentioned how co-ops um, work with farmers that they brought back the produce and the products that they had. You know, the supply chain was affected during the 
during the pandemic and it's still a little bit affected now because of what is going on but because you had um a range of farmers i can't remember the number i think it was 185 you said casey that um each co-op uh, store or location worked with, you are able to still tap into that supply chain and your food is not coming from outside your area. So it, it was just, um, I mean, that part of it and the fact that the communities worked together to be able to solve the problems, to think about stuff. Um, Casey, Casey's last slide was about, um, um, the heroes that we call the grocery workers, you know, they they were just phenomenal in um, reaching out and making sure the supply chain um, continued. There were so many um, co-ops that we heard from, you know, because we were in, a lot of them, you know, were doing business with them and we had a check up on them. You know, how are you doing to make sure that everything was working and uh, they were full of praises for um, their workers, you know, and all of them are also local. So you cannot overemphasize, you know, local from the workers to the farmers to how the decisions were made and, uh, and um, having the community support. Um, and lastly, one other thing I wanted to mention was um, um, leadership. You know, there were a lot of people that stood up during this period and uh, it generated a lot of leaders during that period who went on to do, um, who are still doing a lot of various things now, um, just because they were able to um, rise up through that community or the co-op and um, become leaders today. Um, the last but not the least is uh, weaknesses, right? Um, mm -hmm. I also say that part of our strengths are also some of our weaknesses, you know? So some of the time, um, you know, everything that affected everybody else also affected uh, the co-ops, you know, so like economic um, situations, uh, the pandemic regulations, all these things affect everybody, but they also affect uh, co-ops. But um, sometimes our, uh, our decision-making process can be slowed down a little bit because we like, uh, we like just because of the nature of our um, ownership, we have to take into consideration a lot of steps and a lot of people to be able to uh, make decisions. And that was part of, or that's one of the weaknesses that we see. And um, also the pandemic and going forward also slowed down, um, also um, highlighted the fact that um, there's a missing component of um, technology you know, with some of the co-ops that, you know, there's a lot that's happened between when um, the pandemic hit and now, but um, there's still a lot to be desired in that, um, in that sector. And um, the last thing is um, during that period, a lot of co-ops ran out, they, 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 I won't say ran out of cash, but, um, because of who we are and how we run our businesses, we um, have patronage, right? And the patronage that we pay out um, doesn't allow us to keep <clears throat> a lot of cash equity in the business, which might have been helpful during, um, during uh, the pandemic and shortly after. But a lot of co-ops survived it. They're doing better. There were a lot of programs that were done that we were able to help to um, administer to some of the co-ops. So um, a lot of them have turned around and um, yeah. things are looking- and Dami, you know, if, I, if I might pick up on that just very quickly, I wanna hand it right, right to KZ is the, the, um, the, the co-ops in the food system, NCG, other food co-ops, ag co-ops, they, they were part of the advocacy effort to make sure that co-ops could participate in the, um, in the economic disaster assistance that came you know, in March of April at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and CBA Clusa was really, and we got data that uh, last week that um, the co-ops uh, leveraged $1.9 billion in, in that assistance, the, pay, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, the EIDL, uh, thousands and thousands of co-ops uh, including, but, uh, but that, was, that was part of the co-ops all coming together because if we didn't, we, 
there's a good chance a lot of co-ops wouldn't have been eligible for that. And, and we continue to refine that. But Casey, I want to go to you, kind of the same question on, um, and then, and then you know, I'll just expand on it. It's pretty much the same question on the gaps uh, in the needs in the contemporary food system. Um, you know, what might be needed uh, for co-ops to serve better than their competitors. So that's, a, that's another turn on strength and weaknesses. Uh, well, yeah, well, I think that uh, that our relationship with suppliers, local suppliers, as well as thinking about how we can contribute to more resilience within the food system, the producers, the distributors, you know, I mean, it's a big system uh, that um, having as a group, having identity and having a relationship with the with everyone in that system really strengthens our position and gives us a chance to give consumers access to products that are not um, being pushed on them, right? I mean, that's part of what co-ops got started doing was to provide an alternative to, uh, for essential services that was not manipulative. It's not we're being told you must buy this or if you want flour, you can only get this really crappy flour that's been mm -hmm. um, cut, uh, with, you know, because it's the company store. But, um, but, but we put consumers in the ownership position. So um, mm -hmm. that's, I think, something that our co-op, uh, retail co-op can really contribute in terms of a stronger uh, food system. Gaps, I mean, I think, uh, Dami mentioned one of them, we can be very conservative. I mean, we, we are conservative by nature. We have thousands of owners. It's not easy for us to say what is in the best interest of those thousands of owners as it is for a sole proprietorship or if it's small family owned business to say, bing, we're gonna grab that real estate over there on that side of town and we're gonna um, sign the lease tomorrow. Um, you know, it's hard, it's, it takes, longer for our food co-ops to do that. Um, but uh, I, I think that um, the one of the things that we saw that co-ops did uh, through, through COVID especially was that they pivoted so quickly to um, putting up plexiglass barriers, to thinking about what that meant, to taking down their prepared foods departments um, a lot, I mean, that's where a lot of their money is made. It hurt, uh, it was really painful. We have 40% uh, of our staff sometimes are involved in that prepared food department. Um, they were still paying their wages. Um, you know, they had to figure out how to get them busy in other areas at, or they just were subsidizing wages that really drained their cash, but they did it. They didn't say, no, we're not gonna do that. They said, this is what we have to do. We have to continue to do that. Um, let's see, you also asked for um, needs. I think healthy food access programming continues mm. to be a big need. We need, to, we need to challenge ourselves, I think, uh, the retail food co-ops to figure out how we can do more, 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 more in terms of getting healthy food into everyone's hands and really um, um, step up in that way. That's great. Okay, thanks, Casey. And we're at, I'm I'm noticing time, um, and so I want to uh, to to shift to a to a question or two from the audience. And we've got we certainly can um, you know we'll, we might come back and talk about a couple other things, but we want to we want to respect everybody's time and and, and keep uh, keep this session to an hour. There's a um, I see some questions in the Q and A, which is great. You can drop them in the chat as well. Um, and I am going to pick up on one um, from uh, uh, from one of the attendees, and it's on Indigenous uh, American Indian inclusion in uh, in the co-op food system. Uh, and I'm going to I'll I'll ask both KZ and, and Dami about uh, there was a there was a great session earlier this week at, at ACE Institute uh, talking about that topic. I'll just do a really quick plug that. NCBA Clues and the Cooperative Development Foundation actually has a, has a conference uh, the first week of August on this topic, how co-ops or how, how Native American communities can use uh, cooperatives in their food system. So uh, take a look at our at NCBA Clues website. You can sign up for that. But, but I'll, I'll ask uh, maybe KZ or, or Jump Ball, Dami, if you want to jump in. Um, any experience or, or work with, um, with tribal communities on uh, food system? 
Well, I can just say quickly from MTG's perspective, I mean, we, we're trying to identify who are the suppliers uh, that could we could potentially be working with. Certainly of those 185 average number of locally produced food items, local producers that each of our co-ops works with, there's an in in different communities there are some some of those are indigenously owned or um, produced items um, but not you know we, we just don't have the data um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, certainly we we encourage our co-ops to do that I think most of them try their best um, mm -hmm. where they can um, but as a system you know we're trying to just find out who are those producers where are they, how are they distributing their products? How can we promote those products? How can we spotlight them? And uh, that applies to indigenous as well as other uh, categories. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we, we think it's a, it builds resilience in our food system to, to spotlight mm -hmm. producers like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're excited to have, actually, we'll have, we'll have Casey's uh, CEO CEP is going to going to participate uh, in in the conference in, in August. Uh, Dami, uh, any um, anything to add on on um, working with uh, indigenous uh, Native American communities, American Indians? Yeah, so <clears throat> we 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 do a lot of work with um, with uh, Native Americans, but we it's not a lot in the food system. You know, mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of um, companies that we support. And we finance, um, but but not just in the food system that much. But you know, the funny thing I wanted to bring up was talking. You 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 had first of all two things. Um, yes, kudos to NCBA and uh, NCG and everybody that made um, PPP work for the co-ops. Mm -hmm. It was very very important. It's um, I mean I look at the numbers again. Please understand that I look. I'm a numbers guy. I look at the numbers and I see what PPP was able to do for a lot of co-ops. So um, dog to you and to, and, and to NCG, kudos and to everybody. I mean, I know NCB also played a huge role in trying to make sure that um, co-ops were, were, were involved. Um, and then quickly about the food system in, in, in uh, uh, native communities. Uh, you know, there was a day I went to Wakefront, by the way, we finance, also finance Wakefront. And um, we were we were touring one of the stores, and I found out that all um, a lot of the seafood comes from Alaska. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. I mean, it's it's just amazing. So I don't know if there's an opportunity for um, for co-ops out there to work with them in what Casey was referring to in terms of like um, distributing or distribution because they actually fly them in, and I'm like, oh wow, this is amazing, but. Um, we don't directly work with uh, a lot of like the food systems there. I know there's a co-op in Sitka. We've been talking to them about up and coming and all of that. So. Right, right, right. Well, good. Well, thank you, Dami. Thanks, uh, thanks for that response. I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll take another one from the the audience, and then, uh, and then I have an exit on on kind of the future of of co-ops and the food systems for for both of you. But, but I do want to take this first one, um, and it's about um, the critical links in the food chain. And this is from one of our Canadian colleagues, cooperators. Uh, and it's a person, a consultant who's been working to, to make those links and synergies with co-ops in the US. Um, in this case, to help marketing organic feed corn, which I, which I know is it's a, it's a huge uh, issue in the US too, uh, finding enough organic uh, feed corn. Uh, this person's in Southeast Quebec and, and asking about how to, how to make those linkages. And I, I wanted to, to surface this question just a little bit to, to, to talk about principle six for just a quick moment, principle six in the food system. Um, we've been, since, I, I, uh, since I've been CEO for about four years, in fact, it, KZ and, and the other directors from uh, the United States three years ago, two years ago, uh, we're in Quebec, uh, Quebec City for the uh, for the CMC annual consumer co-op and as well as their board meeting and had a wonderful exchange. And we've been working more and more with our Canadian counterparts to look for those linkages. And we look forward to growing that through CMC and St. Mary's University and, and others. And, and I think that question also points out the, the, the potential, Casey talked about it too, of co-ops being deliberate and thoughtful 
about sourcing you know, from co-ops within the cooperative ecosystem. Uh, and I think there's a lot of opportunity there uh, to help you know, to help those firms that are owned and controlled by the people who use the business, of course. Um, you know, so I'll, 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 I'll respond more specifically, I think, to my Canadian friend on, on her particular question there, or his particular question. We're, we're at 11.54, and I did want to, to talk about the, the future um, and uh, ask Dami and KZ about uh, the, the potential, you know, what what could we be doing um, uh, to make sure that all the different stakeholders and, and the players in the food systems, from the consumers to the farmers to the people who work in the food system, are able to use the cooperative business model, uh, you know, to 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 make it better. And um, and here's a hint: uh, education might be a good a good part of your uh, answer. <laughs> Casey, you want to go ahead? Go ahead. Oh, okay. So, um, you know, um, since our role, my own role is on the side of the financing of, uh, of, uh, of co-ops, um, what I would want to say, what I, what I would see um, in, in, in co-ops going forward is that they play very, very, very critical um, role in in the food system and especially because of the uh, because of the role that they play in, in 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 local and I always say to someone I said you have to be able to uh, do well before you can do good so there are a few things that you have to do just like you rightly said Doug the first thing is to educate your members to get the word out there not just your members because as co-ops most of us we like talking to each other but I always say that we should get the message out on what we're doing and I see uh, co-ops um, <clears throat> playing a very 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 major role because things are coming I mean when I see things a lot of the um, um, companies that you see are, you know, trying to form communities to be able to do things around, around uh, to be able to do things. So to me, it's a form of co-op. They might not call themselves co-ops, but it's a form of co-op. And I think that um, in the future, we'll see a major role for, uh, for co-ops. So education, um, getting out there involved, getting involved in your local communities. Um, also, doing whatever it is that you're doing, doing it very well. So if you're a co-op store, um, making sure that it's being run extremely well. If it's uh, an educational system or a school, make sure that you're doing the right thing and doing it extremely well so that um, we're not just co-ops because we're co-ops, but we're co-ops because we're doing things extremely very well, so. That makes sense. Thank you, Dami. KZ? Well, uh, you know, I just go back to uh, cooperation, to working together, um, to figuring out how we can continue to be strong locally owned businesses and all that we're committed to there um, by being a stronger system. And, and it's a very fine, delicate uh, balancing act, you know, more margin, more mission, definitely. Uh, better operators uh, means that the customer experience is better. And more people are attracted to the store, but um, but that comes at a cost. Also, you know, more margin means more dollars to into the pockets of the employees, to the producers. We can pay the producers better, but it also means the consumers are paying us more. So, uh, you know, we're owned by the consumers, and we have to balance those interests. And it's uh, it's challenging. We do think that cooperation and working together that we are stronger together and um, making sure everyone understands that the education side of things is um, mm -hmm. is really critical. Um, we also just recognize at NCG level that that we need to get better at technology. We are just mm -hmm. really we're being left in the dust uh, in terms of the industry and cu customer expectations. Um, have more technology interface for even for groceries. Uh, so we, that's just something we have to, we have to work on. Yeah, uh, that's, I, uh, those are, I think those are great comments when we look at the future and, and um, uh, that, I'll pick up on that technology. I want to talk about education just for a second, you know, Dami, 
talked about that sometimes that dynamic of, of cooperatives um, and their, their, you know, whether it's the capital reserves or the ability to access outside capital, you know, we know that that's a, um, uh, as, a, as a business that in its genes, um, they, they put outside investors, you know, secondary. Uh, the result of that is, is um, you know, is, is getting that capital to invest in something like IT. You know, and there's a huge upfront investment in, in making mm -hmm. sure that you that you have IT and then a continual investment. So um, I do see that as a challenge, but it's imperative, you know, that that it's absolutely imperative, just as you said, KZ. To to both Dami and KZ's point on uh, you know, the 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 bicycle that we all need to ride as cooperatives, you know, meeting our, our mission, maybe, you know, essentially um, the seventh principle. Uh, but being viable and growing, so so you have that margin, so you can meet the mission on both sides of that bicycle. Uh, we the, the the way to to grow and to be viable and successful is continual education, deeper education, innovating the way that we educate with technology, etc. Uh, it's just so critical. So that I'll, I'll just finish and say, you know, thank you to this audience and to ACE and for continuing. The legacy of the institute, uh, because of the the criticality of you know of this work for for the cooperative movement and including in the food system. Uh, Michael, I see you're back. I just want to thank Dami and KZ and Ace and uh, everyone. It was a fantastic conversation today. Thank you, everyone. Oh, campers, have a great week, campers. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Dami. Thank you, Doug. Excellent moderation, and thank you. Uh... KZ as well, uh, if I may. Um, it was really great session, great conversation. Uh, it'll be recorded and we'll be sure to share that, but uh, appreciate everyone for the active conversation in the chat as well. So just uh, another thank you to our sponsors, Ralph K. Morris Foundation, Shared Capital Cooperative, uh, and lastly, the Minnesota Farmers Union. Thank you to the campers who attended today. It's always great to have some young educators and uh, future educators among us. Um, and with that, ACE will be hosting a, uh, an open mic in about an hour. It'll be at this same link. So feel free to join. If you have anything you want to share about your cooperative, that is the way to do it. Uh, Karen has just put her email in the chat. If you would like to connect with her directly, please feel free to do that. And then Karen as well, if, if you would like to, to send the slides to me, I can share them uh, to those who participated in the event today. Uh, with that, we have our last two concurrent sessions this afternoon. One will be in French with simultaneous translation, and then one will be from our partners in Puerto Rico talking about electric co-ops in Puerto Rico. So really looking forward to those two sessions. They start at 2.30 Eastern. Same link. And with that, I wish everyone a wonderful rest of your afternoon if you're on Eastern time now. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you.